You're all right. <laughs> this morning we complete the series of talks on the principles of nature as they come to us in the human body. We have always recognized the human body as a miniature of the world. Paracelsus describes it as one of the three great books of creation. Anything that we seek for in the functions of the living bodies, we will find in the human form. If it is not in the body of the human being, then it is not part of the material nature to which we belong. But there, behind this is a great deal of philosophy which is not so well known. And in this uh, various uh, divisions, or in these divisions, there are points that I think of basic interest, particularly this morning. We are dealing with the spirit now only in its essential nature as the human spirit. We're not going out into space. On the other hand, if we then can solve the mystery of the human spirit, we have solved the mystery of space. The difference is in magnitude, but not in principle. Therefore, we start in with the study of the spirit, and we begin to study it in terms of Bible literature, because we have a great many keys in the Holy, in the Holy Scriptures. Actually, we find, therefore, that in the beginning there was space, and in space there was an eternal power. This eternal power we call God. We do not know what it is really. We cannot experience it in its fullness. We cannot know exactly where it might have begun if it ever did, or where it might end if it ever does. But for all practical purposes, the Spirit is the eternal foundation of all change. All mutations take place within it, but Spirit itself is never divided. This was one of the Pythagorean theorems. And in space itself, which becomes more or less the negative polarity of God, in space we have a symbol of a vast immensity within which creations of uncounted worlds come into existence. The astronomer beholds part of this mystery, but he has found no answer to explain it. We find many, many evidences of the presence of these universal principles, but we cannot solve their origin or animate their destiny. So we have to take certain things for granted. Now, in our own physical life, we have a combination of circumstances. We might liken this life to an electric light bulb. When uh, the light is turned on, the bulb shines, and we have light. Someone turns off the bulb, there is no more light. After a while, the bulb itself will burn out. Maybe it will give 100 hours or 500 hours, but ultimately, the bulb will burn out. And someone is apt to say at that, that time that the light has died. It hasn't. It is the bulb that is worn out. And in the study of the human being, this is particularly important. The human being never really dies. It is only the bulb that is burned out. The body of the human being is so involved in the material substances of existence that the wear and tear of the spirit within attempting to manifest outwardly results in the course of time of the bulb burning out. The more advanced the individual becomes, the more he shelters and guards the light within himself, the longer the blaze will continue. But ultimately, it has been said in the ancient writings, all compounds must be dissolved. The make great compound for man is spirit and body. This compound must ultimately be dissolved. But how is it to be ultimately ended or changed? 
It is to be ended or changed by transformation and transmutation. The individual as a being never dies. It is only the body which becoming exhausted of potential is no longer able to carry on. But with more discipline, more understanding, and more insight, the spirit has a longer duration. The growth of the person, the unfoldment of, its, of the nobility of the individual, the positive use of its creative and constructive skills, all these things help to lengthen the life of the bulb. They all help the individual to transmute or to create a new level of understanding. And each level as it rises is more subtle, more gentle, more permanent than those that have gone before. Therefore, evolution for man is a gradual unfolding of the body to permit the light to shine through. And the more highly evolved the person becomes, the more beautifully the light does shine through. So this morning we want to take a little study of some of these factors to see if we can make them a little clearer. In the uh, Buddhistic doctrine, we find a study of the planes or levels upon which the human being functions. And we find these levels based largely upon Hinduism in the understanding or interpretation. According to not only the Eastern teachings, but many of the Western schools also, the proper abode of the spirit in man is in the apex of the left ventricle of the heart. The spirit rules from the heart, the, moon, the, the mind rules from the brain, and the body rules from the solar plexus and the lower gangulated structures of the body. Therefore, we begin with Buddha's transmission of the idea of the Septapana cavern. The Septapana cavern was where the Buddhist initiates of ancient times received their private or deepest instruction. When they really wished to know the real law, they departed from the general group and retired into the cave of seven rooms where they could meditate in peace. The cave of seven rooms is, of course, the human heart. And it is here that the, that the peace and silence and transmutation takes place. It was there, according to Buddha, that through the quiet contemplation of life, the individual came as near to the spiritual truth as it is possible to do in an embodied state. So out of the Septapana, the cave of the seven rooms, came the Arhats and those who were to carry on the Blessed Doctrine until the advent of the Maitreya. And they actually also, according to uh, some of the psychic uh, peoples, I think of Andrew Jackson Davis for one, the uh, heart is connected with the head and with the crown of the head. And according to mystics, and some psychics. When the time comes for a severance between the body and its indwelling spirit, the functions of the body in the magnetic field are all drawn together and all the energies and principles of the organs, because each organ has its own living entity. All of these entities, all of the spirits of even the smallest drop of blood converge toward the heart. And when they reach the convergence point, they become ready for transmission. They then ascend through the central Shashumna Nadi, or the great tube in the spinal cord, and come to the crown of the head. And the crown of the head, there is a spot, which is the last to solidify in the baby. The small child almost always has a partial opening of the skull at the top. And when it reaches this point, then it enters into the samadhi of the Shashumna Nadi, the thousand petal lotus, and then departs from the body. This procedure is for all, but the problems involving it are well worth careful consideration. First of all, we are informed that the body 
is not just simply an accidental form that's been hung on us for our disappointments. It is part of our really important evolving uh, knowledge because it is through the body that we are capable of studying the actions of other people. Through the body we reach the world, we reach the family, we reach humanity. Through the body we become acquainted with the problems that arise in various degrees of evolution and development of human beings. We find out step by step most of the truths of the inferior world or the lower regions of body. Therefore, it is very important for the individual to recognize that the body becomes the vehicle of the spirit embodied within it. And the spirit embodied within it takes many years to perfect that body, at least bring it to the highest perfection possible. And in that time, it becomes a useful instrument. But today, most folks are not interested in thinking of the body as a vehicle or an instrument of growth. They think of it merely as an organ of extroversion. They think of it as a source of pleasant or unpleasant happenings. They do not realize that this body is a very important school and that within this body in the secret chambers of the heart is the power behind us, behind the physical form, and that this power, together with the similar powers in others, constitutes one gigantic totality, which we call humanity in the world and God in heaven. This quality we then begin to analyze a little bit. We begin to realize that whenever we damage the body by neglect or uh, by dissipation, uh, we are injuring the manifestation of the power within the body. And we are also wearing out unnecessarily the electric light bulb, which is going to go out one of these days from lack of continuing usage. Therefore, it becomes very valuable to realize the importance of controlling and directing the daily life. Nearly all religions and philosophical systems of importance impose disciplines upon the physical existence of the person. These disciplines are often regarded as tremendously important simply as moral attributes of a spiritual growth. This is not the truth of matter, however. The truth is that these experiences which disturb the growth of the inner life work a great hardship upon the total project of man's evolution. We find many cases today where we have a world of people and only able to enjoy body as a reality. To them, spirits and minds and hearts and actually brains, for that matter, are very dim things. The only thing that is int intimately real is the physical body and its contacts. And this is probably one of the greatest mistakes that we make because the physical body is not the reality and never can be because it is something which we ha are here to outgrow. Now, the inducements to outgrow the body are of several kinds. The fun of the inducements, the most common, is that we wear it out or dissipate it into a condition in which it is unable to function. Therefore, we are, in a way, neglecting it out of existence. Another way we use it is by overtaxing it and making a greater effort than the body is capable of supporting. And that way we also reduce its efficiency. Then we also had devoted to false projects, among which, of course, are merely all of the material activities with which we are involved. Uh, incidentally, the last few years particularly, there has been considerable emphasis upon this problem that we are wasting energy, wasting time, and complicating existence by lack of discipline. Yet most people will not discipline themselves until they have to. And nature in its wisdom made health problems to help this disciplining. And then in society created wars and revolutions to indicate what man should not do. But there is no way of coaxing him into a state of virtue. He is not yet old enough and wise enough in his understanding to voluntarily correct his own faults 
without some inducement. And the inducement in almost all cases is freedom from pain or freedom from want or freedom from tension. Therefore, assuming the heart center in the, uh, in the body as being the seat of the spirit, we also find that it is from here that the spirit controls. The spirit does not control from the mind. The spirit controls from the heart. Heart has precedence over mind. Mind is an instrument. We may say that mind may be the chancellor, but the divine power is rested in the heart. And therefore, as the individual comes closer and closer to the heart doctrine, he comes closer to relaxing away from the pressures which disturb or destroy him. It is absolutely essential for the mystic or the individual seeking further spiritual growth to live with a strong heart focus. This means thoughtfulness of other people. It means charity. It means kindness. And it means a loving recognition of the beauties of life and the beauties of nature. And of course, in the heart, which is the abode of our spirit, we worship the spirit, which is, is the abode of us all. Therefore, the heart is very important. And the, the evolution of the individual is not that he becomes wiser and wiser, but rather that he becomes more and more virtuous, more and more in harmony with the great laws of existence. We are in trouble because we break these laws. And when we break these laws, we come in conflict, in conflict with the law as it emerges from the spirit or God within us. The spirit within us is not contaminated by any outside factor. The only thing it can do under pressure is to suffer. And when the heart begins to suffer, we find a great many difficult emotions. And among some of them is the emotion of regret, and sometimes the emotion of hatred or things of this nature. But always the heart has to lead because it is the seat of our immortality. And as it leads more and more, we find that the body reacts more and more constructively. The body has really no desire to take over. The only reason that it has assumed a dictatorship is because the, it is not supported by the conscious dedications of the mind and the emotions. The body does not want to rule the individual. But if nothing else is available, it will step in and do it. And when it does so, there's always trouble. Because the body does not know what the spirit needs. But the spirit knows what the body needs. So we have now this problem of bringing back, um, uh, working with a cycle of re-embodiments around the center of the heart of the individual. Now as he comes into life, the heart becomes part of his essential makeup. He, the heart actually takes control of the body much earlier than we generally think. In fact, the probabilities are that it is there before the first physical cell appears. It is something much more important and more definite and something that has a great deal of, in, of integrity and virtue in it. But by the time the child is born, the heart center is strongly established. And the establishment of it and the processes by which it is established are set forth in the Rig Veda in the avatars of Vishnu. The deity appearing in one body after another until it comes finally to the last body, the Kalki avatar, in which is the white horse. It carries the soul to heaven. But all of the symbols of the ancient religions tell the story of the creation of life within the body and its gradual emergence as an individual existence. It also reacts to the individual when he grows up. He grows up perhaps, fortunately, in a good home where kindly parental doctrines are followed. And then all of a sudden he comes to the dividing of the ways. He must become an individual. He must take on the responsibilities of self-discipline. This is the heart center reminding him 
that he must gradually come to value that above, above everything else on earth. He must know that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And his thinking in the heart is one of the disciplines that is hard to bring to a materialistic, a materially focused civilization. But today we are in the grave danger of uh, misleading ourselves and others. And the time has come definitely to recognize the importance of coming to the throne of the indweller, that which is in within us as long as we live, the spirit of eternity, the unknown and unnamed God. He's a spark in every living thing. This spark is in the lowest creature. It is the fat tie by which all existing forms are bound to absolute immortality. As long as that spark is there, nothing can die. And when the spark can no longer uh, abide because of the disintegrations of the body, then it retires and the body perishes. But then the, the dweller seeks a new flesh embodiment. And when the time comes, is reborn to continue the process. Now, what is this process that it is to continue? It is to continue to fulfill a certain test. It is part of a discipline. And in uh, Northern Buddhism, it is part of an initiation. But, but the material life is a series of tests. It is a series of initiations into the mysteries of existence. All individuals are growing, some more rapidly than others. But no one can come into this world and live a reasonable length of time and go out without having learned something. Sometimes it may, the person may deny that knowledge, but in the after-death experiences it reproves itself. But there is no way of living without growing. But this growing can be stunted. It can be much less than would be natural or normal. It can fail to fulfill its essential purpose. For every step of growth means the correction of a weakness of a, or a fault. And nearly everyone has faults of some kind. Very often we blame other people for them. But in the dweller of the, in the heart knows which, what faults are our own. And those common faults that we have, of course, are hatred and jealousy and uh, selfishness and combativeness and acquisitiveness. All of these faults are involved in two things. The relationship of the individual with the heart within himself and the relationship of nations within the heart of the solar system, which is the sun. In other words... As in the little case, we get into trouble by failing to correct our mistakes. So in the larger case, we get into world catastrophe by failing to correct the great mistakes, which are nothing but the little mistakes grown in size. And we now have a family conflict, a world of words, unpleasant ones, over a back fence, and about the same time, and two or three nations get together and have a bad time. Everything is of the same type, differing in multitude or magnitude, but not in principle. And in principle, all things are leading toward the heart. The mistakes have all divided us from the heart center in ourselves. And our virtues bring us back again to it. And uh, when we come back, however, we are better than we would have been had we not been tempted. Because temptation moves salvation to a task by the individual himself. In other words, there would be no gain by experience if the individual could attain happiness and peace without experience. If he did not have to correct his own mistakes because some benevolent providence did the work for him, he would remain to the end selfish and ignorant. But he is not permitted to do this he is reminded of the fact that his own presence in the world is a proof of his own need for growth, his own continuous challenge by which he must gradually unfold his own integrity. Thus we have another important factor here, health. 
we have the health factor in which individuals who uh, mistakes of one kind or another create various ailments which come, sometimes cut them down in their prime. But altogether, all these things, whether it's, di whether it's uh, di digestive difficulty or an international problem, all arise from the same basic sources. The failure of the conscious person to understand the reason for himself and the way in which he must work with himself to fulfill his own purpose. Now, out in the larger sphere of things, we have concepts of God. And uh, nearly every nation has some concept of the nature of deity. And this nature of deity has been, well, for the most part, built up from a contemplation of superiority in the material world. Those of highest rank are regarded as nearer to deity. Uh, those of various particular outstanding abilities are said to be inspired. <clears throat> but in every case, the, comp the comparison has been that the divinity is a highly glorified humanity. It is a person who has been raised by adulation or public esteem to the estate of a deity. And in ancient times, nearly all deities were glorified human beings remembered for their powers and principles long after their bodies were returned to the earth. So deity became, as to one man called it, a highly glorified King uh, Henry VIII or Louis XVI. Uh, uh, God was the great nobleman and all nations were serfs and all individuals were serfs of this divine power. This has been gradually changed, particularly by Luther in the West, to the realization that the supreme overlord is not a Henry VIII, but that there's only one real ruler, and that is spirit itself. Everything else is a false ruler. But the false ruler must continue until the community or the world earns the right ruler. We must have the difficulties until we outgrow them. And there is no way of outgrowing them vicariously. There is no way in which through a formula we can grow. The growth must be real. And the growth must be tested by the power that is seated in the heart. When the heart power is satisfied, we are right. When the heart power supports us, we are right. But up to that moment or that time, we are in various degrees of rightness and lack of rightness, which we call the ordinary living conditions of humanity. So we find in the stories of the incarnations that we have a broad platform, assuming for general purposes that the human being, in order to fulfill the destiny for which he was uh, created, will probably pass through approximately 1,000 embodiments. Now, this is probably an inexact figure, but it is in, in, in principle is obvious or indic indicative. During this period of time, the entity is learning step by step, and each of the embodiments is one day in the school of the growing spirit. Each day is a, is a struggle, each problem must be faced. But out of it all comes a gradual enrichment. And, and uh, this is well set forth in the Bhagavad Gita. The spirit was never born, and the spirit will never die. But it will be embodied in various forms, and the forms will live and die. But that which is true goes on, and the only thing that it takes with it is the enrichment of its own spiritual insight. Actually, as uh, the Hindus believe, we are all, in a way, gods in the making. Because when we become wise enough to run our own affairs, we will be paid uh, masters over greater things. The purpose of, of all evolution is to produce those stars that shine in the sky, and beyond those, a great silence in which eternity abides forever in its own perfection. 
These things we have to learn by degrees. So the one thing we can do, however, is try to create an easy relationship between the spirit in the heart and the daily conduct of our lives. We can do all that we can to make the spirit happy. We can do what we can to fulfill its natural instinct to know, to grow, to think, to hope. We can also gradually get rid of the weak spots in the armament of our lives. We can learn how to adjust to circumstances, not for the circumstance sake or for our personal sake, but because it is the way in which we worship the powers of life. Actually, virtue is, a, is the instrument of worship. The individual grows only by what he does. His words do not count very much. He is only able to guarantee that which he has performed by the definite effort of his own consciousness. Now, nearly everyone has some virtues to their credit, some more than, another, or than others, but mostly we have quite a bit to our credit. And for the most, most part, we are respectable, kind-hearted, well-intentioned people. But somewhere in our compound nature, there still lurks a great deal of subtle difficulty. And it is because this difficulty is subtle, not quite so obvious, that we have a tendency to struggle desperately against it. In the way back times when battles were solved by throwing rocks at each other, uh, problems could be solved rather simply. But now it's all much more complicated. The surface problems that annoyed our ancestors are very largely no longer dominant. But in their places, the submerged processes have come to the surface. They are much more powerful, much more difficult to handle, and much more rewarding when they are correctly handled. Right now, if we have in the world a definite struggle for peace. Everyone is beginning to realize the tremendous penalty for hatred and discord. Everyone is looking for some way to find peace. And many suggestions have been made in this direction. But if you want to know, really, the answer, the problem will be to work out peace in your own life. And you will realize the difficulties that arise on this effort. That it's not as easy as it looks. Because the pressures and tensions of living bring you into constant contact with people you cannot control. And who will not see it your way. Or who will not become honest simply because they are told to become honest. And the individual gradually weakens and joins them. Or weakens in discouragement and departs in sorrow. This means that we have new and better lessons to, and bigger lessons to learn. And now, in the next 25 or 50 years, we have got to solve most of the problems in society that are, we are now fighting with under our own skin. The war begins inside of us. Hate begins inside of us. All of the pollutions and all of the temptations and the massacres and all the miseries of life have their final origin inside of us. We, you know, we no longer would permit some of them to break through. But when they, a great number of these people, all more or less inadequate, get together and combine, they form a terrible force. So we have to work with those problems. There is no way of outgrowing the problems of society except by outgrowing them. They cannot be legislated. They cannot be forced upon us uh, by laws or by rules or by penalties. They must come through growth. Peace is when the individual has discovered that it is a greater truth than conflict. It is coming nearer and nearer to the core of life. Now, the, the spirit within us has its own functions. It has its own virtues. And peace is one of them. Uh, peace is very important. Let's see a little bit about it. We will say to begin with that peace is a spiritual quality. It is something that belongs to the over-realities of existence. 
the, the germ of peace is in us. The germ of peace is in that heart center where we hope to build the beginning of the golden wedding garment described by St. Paul. But we have now a peace center. What are we going to do with it? Well, there are lots of problems in peace. We would probably all like to have peace, but there are difficulties. One is we don't speak to our neighbor and they don't speak to us. <laughs> that is a small thing, but it's not peace. Another time, we have a big political conflict. Everybody say, wants something different. It ends in confusion. There's no peace and solutions are not found. We have many, many occasions in personal life where we resent people, where we hate people. I work right kneel with people and I know many who have never spoken to a relative in 25 years because of a grievance or a grudge. And yet with that grievance and with that grudge, they consider themselves to be highly spiritual people. But it doesn't look that way from the outside. Actually, the heart center is constantly impelling us to correct all aggressions and all indiscretions, to make life beautiful, to make living a gentle and kindly experience. But between that and the average person is the exalted concept of wealth, the fulfillment of ambition, the tyranny of money, and all the false values which take their places before virtue can be seated. So we do not accomplish this peace. And we talk about it, and we have all kinds of thoughts, but then another war breaks out. We are not learning. Now from occult philosophy perhaps, or at least from the esoteric doctrines, we get a realization of the values involved. But they are so difficult and so ultimate that the average person doesn't even try to meet their demands. They consider that it's much better to die in a half-conscious condition than to struggle with the pressures of self-improvement. But nature isn't going to let us get away with that. Little by little, that virtue is thrust upon us. Day by day, things become worse unless we make them better. Now, as we look around us in the world today and see all these problems, we say to ourselves, what are we going to do about it? What about ourselves? If the war breaks out, are we going to be one of the first casualties? If we have a very serious earthquake, are we going to be casualties? We don't know for sure many of these things. There's only one answer to all of it, that whatever may come, we can carry it with peace that within ourselves we have the strength to meet adversity without compromise. And without compromise, we are safe. And we are never going to be so hurt that we cannot recover. Whereas without this integrity, many have already committed suicide and many more will. All this works back to the God within. When we make peace with that, we have it. Until we make peace with that, there is nothing but uncertainty. The philosophers of old realized this, and they had various names to indicate these principles. They have talked about the various orders of deities and the various orders of princip principalities of the invisible world. They also tell us many legends and fables about the world as it was before the deluge, in the ancient times when there was peace upon the earth. And we learn from our own scriptures of the beautiful Garden of Eden. Now, the Garden of Eden was a direct production of the principle of God founding the material existence. The Garden of Eden was the, it was the neo, nearly perfect production of spirit. It, in its own natural form and natural state, it was at peace with all things. It was a, a paradisical sphere, and it was here that man studied the sacred writings, and his teachers were the angels. 
All of this is symbolical language, but it stands for a great meaning, for a great mystery. And that is the mystery of the material existence in its own purity. The material existence was not a world originally of pressures and of tyrannies. But into this world came Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, one for one reason or another, were captured by the web of ulterior motive. They became involved in relationships which were not according to the doctrine that created Eden. So they were cast out of the garden and were set out into the world. And the world as we have it today is Eden polluted. It is Eden gone. It is Eden that is no longer in the valley of the Euphrates. It is the Eden that is no longer in the high Hemavats or in the mysterious temples along the Niles of Egypt. It is no longer here. There's only one way now to find this Eden again, and that is in ourselves. We must restore it in our own conduct, in our own inner life. And what do we mean by an inner life in this case? We don't mean just the job. We don't mean just the dinner and the meals, all the taking care of the children, all the eternal and inevitable television programs. We don't mean that. We mean a life a life in which the individual achieves an individual adjustment with life. A life in which there are values gradually growing up. Now, if there are values growing up in the lives of parents, the children will grow better. If there are new values growing up in children, their relationships with elders will be better. In every case, we have 24-hour days and a part of that day, to quote even a character that is not so popular right now, Muhammad says that the 24-inch gauge is the measure of the individual. Three times eight hours makes the 24 hours of the day. These 24 hours are eight hours for labor, eight hours for rest, and eight hours for growth. So the, de the definite special attempt and understanding to improve oneself, to become more wise in good things, to become more patient in adversity, to become better informed on important details of life living, and also having time for kindly relationships with our neighbors. In other words, we have to make a section, a selection, in which every day there is time for growth, Without some time set apart from growth, it will not, not going to make too much difference, maybe, in the long run, because we will keep on coming back, pestered with the same problems, until we grow up. We can do it maybe in ten lives, or may take a hundred, but we will ultimately do what is right. And the struggle to do what is right is now for us, or for many people, a terrible, terrible task. The idea of turning off that television is more than the average person can stand. <laughs> and furthermore, turning it on is more difficult than turning it off. And there seems to be no answer except to buy a larger instrument or to get in other stations. But we are going to be in the same way all the time. We are looking for one thing, for rest, for relaxation, for a sense of security for sharing in life with others in the daily living problems of existence. We're not going to find it this way. We're not going to find it because we have more or less excluded the spirit from our entire pattern. We have set aside no time to which just to be human and give thanks for the privileges of existence in this world. We do not try to use the hours not necessarily for heavy mental, mental uh, struggle but for gracious acceptance gracious adjustment and a gradual quiet maturing of our emotional and psychological structures we are entitled to rest and repose but we do not have any 
we had more repose in the old days of the sweatshop than we have today. And that's quite a, quite a span. So basically everything that we do that is repose, that is quiet, that is peaceful, that represents a conscious effort to be better is re registered in the apex of the left ventricle of the heart. The spirit becomes aware or is aware for the reason that every one of these benevolent improvements releases part of the spiritual power that is locked within us. Now this power is variously gradated and very carefully classified. Some parts of this power will be better. If it helps our digestion, other parts will help us to get along with our children better. Some other part will help us to be better citizens. Still another will help us to get off of narcotics. We have all kinds of potential help for anything that we need. But the individual must make the first step himself. As Buddha said, the long journey, which is evolution, begins with a single step. And each of us must make the first step or two in, in development of our inner lives before we can begin to get the support from that which is within ourselves forever. We must wake, wake the, the sleeping power that rests in the heart. Now when we wake from that power, then we go through this transmission of records and changes into the higher bodies. We go from the physical to the next one, which is the ethereal or vital, and we go on up until we go to the mental, the emotional, and finally enter what they call in India the buddhic plane. We have no English term that is exactly for this, but it means in actual art that it is a place of understanding, of self-realization. It is a, the place where the curtain goes up and the facts become more obvious. It is a place where you can stand and look out of a window, and as you watch, a curtain is drawn away from the window and you can see what is behind. This is the Buddhic teeth of the ancient Oriental philosophies. It is the first conscious view of the, of the totality of life. It is a look at the sky in which the sky disappears and instead becomes a vast race of deities or powers going on forever. It is also a marvelous opportunity to realize that we are of them. We are part of them. There are others coming after that are less than ourselves. There are others going ahead who are greater than ourselves. But there is an enormous motion going on all the time. And uh, we might ask ourselves, why this motion? What does it all add up to? We can't keep on growing forever and ever and ever. And most of the reposing points along the way are not very tempting. We have to know then what is the final result of this all. And we know that the world's great div divisions, the great months and twelves into which nature is divided, that this is a the cycle for the development of the four kingdoms that we have here now. That gradually they will outgrow and go on and evolve. And stars and worlds and suns and planets and galaxies are all part of the unfoldment of this one great spiritual entity. And in the end, there will be only this one. All things that have led up to it will have become then part of it. All growth has ended when the parts become identical with the entire. And in that moment, there is the great flash of infinite wisdom that can never cease. The infinite understanding, the infinite light, the infinite sharing. It is not necessary for us to be individual forever in order to be people. The more that we will overcome individuality and show a common knowledge, the greater we are. 
and the time when the eye of the Spirit is truly open, there will be one people and one God, and we will all become part of one eternal pattern. And we will not be anxious any longer to compete with our friend or be richer than our neighbor, but we will be part of something which needs nothing because it has already achieved all things within itself. And as this evolutionary process goes on, eternal totalities rise from the darkness. And these totalities represent new beings. When humanity becomes one creature, it will become another being. And this being will create other worlds to go on and on. But in the end, there will be no sense of growth in this being. There will be no sense of need, no sense of emergency. All things will be according to reality. And this one overgrown, over overdeveloped reality will be like a parent. The parent may not know exactly how to handle the child. But when we all, through conscious evolution, become parents of races, parents of nations, parents of genera of all kinds, when we become parents of great orders of life, we will find that we will be given the strength to make these necessary decisions. We may be a group spirit over a whole kingdom of life, but this does not mean trouble, because we have left trouble behind. We left our troubles with selfishness somewhere in the distance. And the lower order of life is struggling with the selfishness that we are now re relieved of by our own growth and our own fulfillment of the purpose and destiny of ourselves. So we go on, but we become more and more one until finally we don't need to see with the two eyes. For when we see with the one eye, we see all things. And we see the same thing that we see as we think of God as seeing. Somehow we realize or believe that the divine power is aware of all things, that recognizes even a sparrow's fall. Well, that probably is true. The all power is just perfectly aware of the, sparrow, of the sparrow's fall, as it is of the great space collapse or something, because it is now only one, and we come into a new dimension of, of, of intelligence. Intelligence becomes universalized even before consciousness does. Suddenly there is only one mind and we are all part of it. And this one mind flashes inside of all of us and brings us into peace. When we understand mind, we will all be friends. When we understand emotion, we will all be kind. It is that because there is only one emotion of kindness and it is distributed individually in various degrees of development to the five billion or six billion human beings now inhabiting the earth. But sometime there will be one kindness which will be shared by all because they have grown up to it. Our great problem has been haste probably. We've been in a great hurry to get somewhere where we were not entitled to go. We were supposed to grow, instead of that we made a wild dash after something. We believe in some way that by means of nuclear fission we're going to anticipate 10 million years of evolution. Why not? We probably slow it down a few million years, that's all. We are not, we are not looking at it right. We are assuming that the development of material pro problems and potentials will advance this growth. It's not actually true, because these things we are invented, are inventing now should be known only after we have intelligence enough to use them correctly. We should have become human first before we invented the bomb. If we had, we would have no bomb. But by failing to grow inside of ourselves, we have permitted nations to destroy each other and endanger the survival of all. Today we have another emergency coming in. And against this emergency, we are trying to build people who can understand the values. 
and can realize that it is possible for us to get together and work out problems constructively. Now, it may well also be that uh, in these great stressed periods that uh, circumstances will arise which we cannot control. We have not become wise enough. So therefore, we are able only to destroy ourselves. We do not know any better. But here is the rub. No one ever destroyed himself or anybody else. All these things are part of an illusion. The illusion based upon the inevitable reality of the obvious. Where everything that you see is real, everything that you do not see is unreal. When the very actual realities are, that the things that are real are mostly invisible, but very real within the person. And all the virtues that we need to correct the outside condition are present within our own natures. But we have to develop them. We cannot affirm them. There is no use writing petitions with them. It must be a gradual, inevitable unfolding of the relationship between ourselves as persons and ourselves as principles in, night, in life and space. The entire solution to the human life wave problem lies in the outgrowing of the ignorance even as in the growth of the small child, the problem is to bring it up to maturity. Now, if you took the small child today in the environment in which we now function, we know that most parents are having many difficulties. The child is precocious. The child has all kinds of whimsies. It can be terribly annoying. It can be very bitter in its attitudes. It can be hopelessly extravagant. It can avoid all work and responsibility. And the parents get into more and more difficulties. But this is also true in the great composite child, the human race. The human race is spoiled at the moment, badly so. But it's spoiled with things that cannot succeed. It has created an artificial world out of harmony with a natural world which is magnificent in itself. We have suddenly tried to create something better than good and have found only something that is worse than bad. We do not have the right attitude on these things. We have not been willing to accept these realities. Francis of Assisi who was well aware of this. He came from a rather bad background. He was a rather dissolute young man. But when he became aware of the spiritual values of life, it completely altered him. And he became, what, about all he could in those days, a member of a religious house. Today, we've got to make the world into a religious house. A few people retiring into monasteries won't do it. This whole world has got to take on a little bit of the looks of a monastery or a convent or something in which it is, there are people who are self-disciplined. This point has been strongly made by the Zen masters of Asia, that there's nothing that you can talk about, there's nothing you can affirm, there's nothing you can read about, there's nothing that you can talk about that does anything unless it is accompanied by an appropriate action. If you believe in peace, you practice it. If you believe in forgiving mistakes of other people, you start right in forgiving them. But all the talking in the world will not correct anything unless it leads almost immediately to an action consistent with itself. So all the way along, we are fighting to bring through the divine state that we lost. Paradise has retired into, with God into our hearts. It is still there. The, the God of ages has never passed on and never changed. But in its infinite manifestations, it has come to be known by various names. And in our little way of world, in which each of us has a spark of God in ourselves, we want to name one of the sparks John and another spark Joanne. But they're the same spark, and there's only one. But they are apparently separate. And for every argument between two peoples, we have a symbol 
of an argument between two parts of ourselves because all arguments can find their root within our own natures. So it becomes very interesting to, to study some of these things and it's very interesting to look forward to the time somewhere, sometime, when these problems will be solved, when we will find again the Edenic world of ancient thought where we will live at peace in a gentle world. And as soon as we accomplish this and we have quietly settled and we are one with our own hearts and we think most of others and our loves are sincere and devout and our faith is strong, when we get that, we will have a beautiful vacation in a little world of gold, of gold and glory. We don't know just what it's going to look like, but it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be wonderful and we're going to feel that we're being rewarded for everything we've ever gone through. And when we get a good vacation, we'll start a new job and go through more than we've ever gone through before. But all the way, we will be growing towards a complete conscious identification with the one infinite reality at the source of life. The journey goes on. We came from God and the journey goes on and so we go home. We have little pauses along the way. But in every instance, the journey is towards the spirit in ourselves. And the spirit within ourselves is our link with a universal spirit. When we find reality in our own hearts, we will discover it in the, all of the hearts of the world and all the worlds that are within the great heart of truth. The astronomer looking for outward can't imagine how all these wonderful worlds came into existence. He wonders he can't really understand because he doesn't see the infinite invisible which is behind. But the mother looking at a newborn babe is looking at a creation that is just as important, just as mysterious, and just as sacred as the bringing forth of nations and of worlds and of planets and of stars. They're all part of the manifestation of infinite life. And when the human being is able to adjust his personal consciousness to the, for the mysteries of eternity to come through him, he will find that he has a very nice and peaceful time ahead. He won't be lazy. He won't just go on just hoping that there will be new legislations and he'll get more for his money. Nothing of this nature. All that is lost because barter and exchange, as we know them, are not for the right motive. If barter and exchange is in order to make profit, then we are truly material and we have made a divine adjustment with a material situation which never can improve. But when we share with others or we trade with others or we exchange with others for the common good to bring, to bring peace, to bring happiness and share together in both our abundances and our shortcomings. We will then have a brotherhood of humanity. And when we have a brotherhood of humanity on earth, we will discover the unity of God in heaven. These things are interrelated in a strange and wonderful way. And it is hoped that in the course of this 21st century that is coming, we will take another major step to the realization that we are one creation, one person, one sufferer, one dreamer, and trying to build out of all of the confusion of life our own understanding and our realization that this plan is right and good and that the mysterious power of the at the seat of it and the cause of it is worthy of our affection, our devotion, and our veneration. We hope all these things will come about in due time. In the meantime, however, we have our little problems to solve. But the main thing now, for, for just at the moment, is give the heart as much nourishment as you can. Take care of it physically, it will give you length of years. Take care of it psychologically, and it will give you depth of insight. Take care of it spiritually, 
and it will give you the experience of God. All these things are part of the great experience, and the world that leads to God is always through the hearts of living things. That's it.